In making this video, I do not mean to downplay the importance of defeating a deranged Christian fundamentalist pedophile in a deep red state and preventing him from taking up a multiple year term in the United States Senate. Keeping someone as personally reprehensible and as ideologically right wing as Roy Moore out of the Senate, or indeed any public office, is a great thing. However, many of my fellow travelers on the left seem to be getting ahead of themselves and expressing unreasonably optimistic views for the 2018 midterms and beyond. This video is directed at them, and my message is simply that we need to view this special election in its proper context and remember exactly where we stand as a country right now in mid-December 2017. First, there are the giddy establishment Democrats who are shouting from the rooftops as if a victory on the scale of the passage of the New Deal had taken place. It is being more realistic than cynical to observe that the primary motivation of people like Lawrence O'Donnell and Rachel Maddow in inflating the importance of this victory is to make themselves look less absurd. After all, these so-called political experts confidently told rank-and-file Democrats to fall in line behind Hillary because she would surely defeat Trump and win the White House. That didn't happen, as I'm sure you all remember. As soon as the ballots were counted, these same pundits began blabbering nonstop about Russia and haven't come up for air since. Maddow and her friend Chris Hayes do not understand or possibly care that the American people are uninterested in the Russia story and that it is many magnitudes less important than the tax bill, net neutrality, and the coming assault on entitlements. The similarities between present-day Rachel Maddow and vintage 2010 Glenn Beck with his chalkboard conspiracies is striking, and as a former viewer of Maddow, deeply disappointing. I'm not a big fan of arguments from authority, but at this point my assumption tends to be that any political predictions by the crew of Morning Joe or Joy Ann Reed or Wolf Blitzer or Rachel Maddow are no more valuable than those of someone's crazy aunt or uncle who had too much to drink at Thanksgiving. The simple fact of the matter is that Jug Jones's win over Roy Moore was not the product of either political acumen on the part of the Democrats or some sort of sea shift in the political allegiance of the American people, but rather the simple fact that Americans hate pedophiles with a burning passion. This hatred of pedophiles is strong enough to overcome political trends and norms, and trying to proclaim a great victory for your pet hermeneutic model of politics or your preferred brand of politics because a pedophile lost an election is either dishonesty, incompetence, or both. There's a second point that I'd like to make to those people who think that our national nightmare is over and that the rejection of a pedophile somehow means that the conservative South has seen the light on race, gender, and sexual orientation. Again, public service announcement. People really hate pedophiles, and we should beware of trying to glean anything more than that from this particular electoral contest. Further, I would be remiss if I did not point out that despite Moore's extremist positions, he wants to repeal all constitutional amendments after the 10th, horrific track record, he has been removed as a judge twice, and multiple charges of sexual activity with teenage girls while he was in his 30s. Doug Jones only won the election against Roy Moore by about 1.5%. Recreating such a perfect storm in other deep red states does not seem likely. To circle back and address both the pundits and the celebrating masses, another narrative that is cropping up is that this is a great defeat for Donald Trump on a personal level. No, I'm afraid that is just wishful thinking. While you never want to associate yourself with the losing effort in politics, the fact is that Trump's name was not on the ballot. In a state like Alabama, Jones's victory necessitates that many Republicans who voted for Trump voted against more. These voters are probably still pro-Trump conservatives. In a normal special election, to the extent that such a thing is not an oxymoron, an unpopular president will see his minions take a small hit inside of his party's fortress states, but not enough to matter. It might be the case that Trump's voters in deep red states will turn on him and take it out on the Republican Party as a whole, but we will need to see unambiguous and direct evidence of that happening before we can responsibly make such a claim. The X factor that we must force to the forefront of our considerations is that Roy Moore had sex with children, something that most voters simply will not countenance. 
After 2016, the establishment of the Democratic Party, which is wholly beholden to corporate America, was desperate to prove that its strategy of identity politics was both morally right and politically effective, despite obvious evidence to the contrary on both counts. In the 2017 off-year elections, the Virginia party chair came out and said in no uncertain terms that voters were embracing diversity, multiculturalism, political correctness, butterflies, and rainbows. That, of course, ignores the fact that Democrats of all stripes won in that race, including progressives and democratic socialists. What I have seen so far in the 36 hours or so since Jones's victory is that corporate Democrats are going to try to claim full credit for this victory and keep hammering home their anti-substantive messages of unity and leading with nebulous and undefined values. The identity politics crowd will write puff pieces about how Cory Booker, the Dollar General brand Obama, was crucial in mobilizing the black voters of Alabama. I've even less doubt that these same corporatist hacks will ignore the activism of Charles Barkley, an NBA legend and popular broadcaster who told Doug Jones that the Democrats need to stop taking the black community for granted and find ways to unite black and poor white voters since their interests overlap to such a great degree. The news of Moore's defeat has already started to occasion speculative pieces about the 2018 midterms and how the Democrats can reclaim the Senate despite the odds being stacked against them by having to win in red states to do so. After all, anything is apparently possible now that a pedophile has lost an election. However, the 1990s Clintonian quest to find a third way and appeal to a carefully triangulated theoretical average American voter is not going to get the job done unless there is a perfect storm of highly unlikely developments, such as a revelation that all of the Republicans in available Senate seats engage in Nazi cosplay. So what do we do? I'm glad you asked. 1. Articulate a vision for the future which does not rely on simply pointing out that Trump and his goons are bad. Whatever this message ends up being, and whatever the policies at the forefront of the platform, it is important to have a clear reason for running which is neither vague a la Tom lead with our values Perez, or a personal quest to make history a la Hillary Clinton I want to be the first female president. Give people an alternative that is clearly stated and expresses a material goal or series of goals on their behalf. Secondly, and more importantly, build a broad coalition around economics. This is how you bridge the cultural divide between whites and minorities. Everyone worries about their personal finances, health care, education, and the economy as a whole. This was the nature of the Democratic coalition that FDR and LBJ used to create the modern American state. Ever since the Democrats abandoned economic policies which aid the working class, they have struggled against the Republican Party which stands for absolutely nothing which actually benefits the average American citizen. Don't be the lesser of two evils, be a positive good. Make sure that voters know that a Democratic victory will leave them and their loved ones healthier, wealthier, and wiser than a period of Republican control. To summarize, if you want to see the Democrats have a wave election and regain control of the national government in order to stop the Trump administration from enacting more damaging policies, you need to press the Democratic Party to take up stronger and more populist positions on substantive economic issues. If and when they reach office, continue to exert pressure on them to live up to their campaign promises. If the DNC continues to follow the preferred path of Tom Perez and Hillary Clinton, then 2018 will be an opportunity wasted and the Democrats will only make small gains that are insufficient to stop Trump. If, however, the Justice Democrats and others are successful at redirecting the party to a better path, then you might need to invest in a surfboard because 2018 would then suddenly have the potential to become a wave midterm election a la 2010 and 2014.